Hello, Royal History Geeks. It's Gareth here, and I am back to talk to you about the wealth of Lady Margaret Beaufort, the mother of Henry VII, although this is actually looking at her wealth when she was younger, before her first, uh, her first proper uh, marriage, and how extensive her fortune was. You may have noticed um, that I am wearing the same clothes that I wore in the video uh, about Margaret Beaufort and Elizabeth of York, and that is because I'm recording them in the same sitting. It is not because I always wear the same clothes. Although that said, I do wear a check shirt and a jacket an awfully large proportion of the time, so it might be worth uh, looking at uh, investigating that, but it's not a priority. None of you care. I don't really care. So, so on with the show, as, as they say in the biz. So, uh, the reason I'm doing this is because Margaret Beaufort is generally described in history books as uh, when she comes on the scene, normally around the marriage, her marriage to Edmund Tudor. If you don't know much about Margaret Beaufort, there's other videos on there you can you can check them out. I'm not going to be recapping now. It's not fair on the people that have been paying attention. Um, and she's always described as an exceptionally wealthy little girl. Um, and that's one of the things that is seen to make her attractive on the medieval marriage market. So uh, that always captured my imagination. I was like, OK, um, well, how wealthy was she? Uh, and actually, I found there's very little information on the Internet um, or even in books uh, that's, that quantified her wealth in any way. And of course, as ever, uh, when there's a vacuum of information, people fill it with well, with nonsense. Let's, let's be honest. So I've heard people say on forums, uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, well, if Margaret Beaufort, she was so wealthy, why on earth didn't she just, you know, raise an army and defeat Richard, uh, Richard III? And declare herself Queen of England, you know, she was super wealthy. Or, I've even heard it said, I'm probably, mm, don't want to get me started on this, that the reason she was, because when people say to me, oh, you know, she, she killed the princes in the tower, I'm like, oh, really, did she? Well, how would she actually have uh, managed to get hold of them, given Richard had them in a high-security prison in the Tower of London? But, oh, she was so wealthy, though, she was super wealthy, so she could have somehow used that to gain control of the Tower of London and do away with its captive princes. Um, so I thought, okay, let's actually do some research on this and try and work out uh, how rich she was and actually what that means in terms of how rich she was comparable to the other great nobles of the land. And we're talking about her wealth pre her son's accession, even before she started to get um, uh, dowry money from, from her various widowhoods. So I'm talking about her you know, sort of circa 1450 when she was first started, to, her wealth first started to be calculated as she was entering the marriage market, even though she was only seven um, years old at the time. So as so often the case with Margaret Beaufort, if we want a detailed answer, a decent answer or something, we've got to go to this book, which is the Jones and Underwood study. And it's a scholarly study. So it's not, it's hard going, but it's very worth reading that, that really gets into the nitty gritty of things you might be interested about Margaret Beaufort because they've studied it and they've got the brain power, the qualifications and the background to be able to study it properly as well. Anyway, they've got pages and pages and pages on um, the Countess and, and her property. So Margaret's property, her lands, which of course was her source of income and was the source of income for all rich people. Some people have money from service to the king, but no one wanted that. They no wanted an independent landed base to give them their money. Basically, if you look at the um, lands that Margaret had in her possession in 1450, uh, say in her possession, I mean, it would have been, she was she was someone's ward, so they'd have been controlling it, but to her name in 1450, which are basically a chunk of lands that she um, inherits uh, indirectly through her grandmother, Margaret Holland, who was a co-heiress to the uh, to the Earldom of Kent. So there's a big chunk of properties that come to Margaret that way. Then um, there's the money she's going to get when her mum dies, uh, which is factored into Margaret's wealth, because everyone knows it's just a matter of time. And she also seems to have inherited the bulk of the properties um, that John of 
Gaunt first acquired and gave to her grandfather, John Beaufort, which formed the basis of the property base for the earldom of, of Somerset when that's finally granted. So all of these seem to be a Margaret's, and that gives her basically an income of about £1,000 a year. Great. That's interesting to know. But what does that tell us? £1,000, not going to buy much these days. Um, but, a uh, fair few history books there. Yeah. But uh, what does that mean? What does that mean in terms of Margaret's spending power? What does that mean in terms of her relative wealth compared to other other young heiresses or compared to the rest of, of medieval England? If she'd been a man, would that wealth have made her a real military power in the Wars of the Roses? So to get our, a clue about this, we need to wind the clock back about seven years before Margaret was born because in 1436, the war France going, really badly at this point and they need uh, the, the English need to to mount a big big offensive attack um so they're going to levy attacks on all the notes taxes weren't that common then they weren't popular I'm not popular now are they but they weren't common they weren't they weren't something that was done all the time for just general expenditure and not this kind of taxation um anyway had the custom but that's a different thing we won't get into that now and um, so to do that, they audited all the wealthy landowners um, and they worked out how much each one was worth and as a result, how much tax had to be paid. Now, thankfully, the that audit of how much each of them was worth has survived. So we have that. So we have a record of 1436 of all the wealthy landowners and how much income they had every year. If Margaret had been alive in 1436 and if she'd now listen I'm going to listen to me because I'll say this slowly because it is quite confusing if in 1436 when Margaret wasn't born she was minus uh, seven if she'd had her 1450 wealth in 1436 Margaret would have been she's probably been about 11th or 12th on that list but let's say to be to be safe let's say she's in the top 20 in that list so there's about 60 titled families at any one time in late medieval England and Margaret's in the upper upper third she's high she's high up in that upper echelon of nobility okay major 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 health warning what i've just done is a bit jiggery pokery it's not particularly scientific okay so first of all it's clear that a load of the nobles lied about how many rich people not it's not that different to now a lot of rich people have means and ways of ways and means of of hiding their full income uh, and we can we have to look at those all those figures as pretty conservative whereas margaret's figure is actually based on a quite detailed study so margaret's figure is pretty pretty accurate those figures are probably a bit deflated so she's probably not quite as high up as it looks at face value the other thing to say is what I've just done is, is not very scientific. Margaret wasn't alive in 1436. She wasn't. The, her, her income then was, was dispersed among a various different people that, that had access to it. You see, you can't just take her in 1450 and transpose her back into the past. Um, and, and of course, a lot would have changed in those times. Um, this, is, this is mostly agriculture that people are making their money from. It was subject to market forces, what people wanted, um, not to the extent it would be today, but, but to, a, to a real extent. Um, and, and, and it was, was subjected to how well they stewarded that land, uh, not an, an environmental factor, so a, a piece of a, a, a manor, you know, that sort of building block in the feudal system didn't didn't consistently generate the same amount of revenue one year as it would the next. It could have a good year, it could have a bad year, and and the measures that the landlord took in administering that land would, would make a big difference. So there's all kinds of problems with what I've just done, so I want to be honest about that. Nonetheless, it does paint a picture for us, and it starts to give us a sense of scale. So the lowest Land, the lowest earning landowners on that list who are deemed wealthy enough to pay uh, earn about £25 a year. So Margaret's got an income that's 40 times that sum. She's, she's well off. She's rich. Um, separately, um, Chris Given Wilson, who's a brilliant historian um, who, who does a lot on the late medieval era, he, I've read in others of his stuff, he's saying, you know, an earl would expect to enjoy an income of between a thousand and fifteen hundred a year so margaret basically has the income of an earl she's a woman 
and she's single at this at this stage. We'll talk about her income in 1450, but her income broadly equates with that of an earl. Now, there were earls that earned less than that. Um, the Earl of Devon was what, about 700 a year, according to um, that order in, in 1436. And there were some, like the Earl of Warwick, who earned huge amounts more than that. So it's just it's just a it's just a um, it's it's an it's an inaccurate measuring stick, but it's something. Similarly, there were barons that earned more than that. It, it didn't always equate with with ranks. There's even one duke, um, the Duke of Suffolk, whose landed value was about six hundred pounds. So it, it it can't be that scientific. But broadly speaking, that's where Margaret is. So she's not some major power broker in terms of her money. Duke of Buckingham, Duke of York, Earl of Warwick. They're earning three, four, five, six thousand pounds a year. Margaret, Margaret can't hold a candle. Is that the expression? Hold a torch. I don't know what the expression is, but Margaret can't compete with them in terms of land wealth. No way. Not 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 in a country mile. Um, but what's significant about Margaret's wealth is that it's in the hands of one woman, and this is really unusual. It's not unheard of, and there were other women in Margaret's time as wealthy or wealthier at various points. Probably not in 1450, though. And um, it's unusual because, A, women didn't inherit very much. If there was a son, it didn't matter if the son was younger, the son would always inherit the fortune of the father or the fortune of, of the mother if the mother had was independently wealthy. The son would always inherit. And if there's more than one son, it always just went to the eldest son. Maybe a few bits siphoned off that the, the, the noble had managed to acquire over the course of his lifetime to give his son a, a fighting chance. But the core inheritance, the family dynastic inheritance went to the eldest son. So it was preserved, it stayed as one unit, and, and it was passed down throughout the generations. However, if there was no son, which obviously did happen, but there were multiple daughters, then the estate didn't just inherit the elder, didn't just go to the eldest daughter or even to the eldest daughter's husband. It was broken up and went equally or as equal as they could make it to each daughter. Um, because primogeniture doesn't distinguish between uh, the ages of daughters. And you see that, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but in the aristocratic system, like an earl's daughter today, like Downton Abbey, yeah, there's three earl's daughters, they all rank the same. And they all rank uh, the equivalent of the eldest son of an earl, whereas an earl's sons, the eldest son of an earl ranks up here, and the younger sons of an earl's like right, right, right down, um, you know, uh, lower than barons, I think, can't remember. Anyway, that's a tangent. But, um, so so if you had daughters, so Margaret isn't, she's not just unusual in that she's a woman that's inherited, she's the sole legitimate child of the Duke of Somerset. So she's inherited, she doesn't actually inherit his entire fortune because some of it goes back to the crown and some of it entails down to his um, young, his younger brother, Edmund. But she inherits the bulk of it and that's so it's highly unusual that a woman has this much money. And of course, if a single woman has that much money, what does that mean? It means it's up for grabs. <laughs> you know, so a man with no income can marry Margaret and have the same income as an earl. He can live the life of an earl, which of course makes her the perfect husband. She's perfect for Edmund Tudor, who's an earl, not got a lot of money and needs advancement. Um, she's she, she's perfect for, for pretty much anyone. No one wouldn't want to marry her, even if you're one of the wealthy families like the Duke of York or the Earl of Warwick. You're not going to say no to an extra thousand pound if you can get it. So she's hugely sought after on the medieval marriage market. And actually, and that shows how significant it is that she's given to a relative nobody uh, like Edmund Tudor. It shows the politics going on. It shows how, I mean, I don't think Henry VI had much to, I don't, bless him, I love Henry VI, but I don't think he had much to do with any decision. It's probably the Queen, uh, Margaret of Anjou, it's probably Margaret's uncle who are engineering that match and they're looking to, uh, to build a Lancastrian um, stronghold by making the uber loyalist like Edmund, who's the king's brother, locking him in and giving him a fortune. So they're building a kind of Lancastrian base of support for the king, I would guess. That that seems what it's like to me. So that's why Margaret's wealth is so exceptional um, and so unusual. Like I said, it wasn't unique. Um, the daughter of the Duke of Warwick, which is the pre-runners to the Earl, Earl of Warwick, um, a few years before um, Margaret was entering the marriage market, would have been an even wealthier heiress, but she died, sadly, before she could do much with it. Um, similarly, when, um, again, going back, it's that Warwick inheritance, when the 
the the daughters of the Earl of Warwick after he's killed on the battlefield, and his wife, who's actually the the inherit heretrix, is kind of is kind of done away with, declared legally dead. When um, when it, um, Isabel Neville and Anne Neville are heiresses to that Warwick fortune, both of them, even though they'd split it between them, both of them would still have had more than than Margaret. This just to touch on, I may as well talk. You don't have to carry on watching the. Um, this this point of female inheritance, nobles, the nobility, absolutely hated um, daughters inheriting. Now, it wasn't because they didn't like their daughters, um, and it wasn't because they were acting out misogynists. Of course, they did have terrible attitudes toward women. There's no doubt about that. But it wasn't particularly misogyny itself that drove their hatred of um, a female inheritance. The reason they inherited it was because of what I outlined earlier about how eldest son, it all goes to that one boy and it's not broken up. If you go to the daughters, the estate's broken up. And of course, if you keep going down the lines, that happens more and more and more and more. But not only, so you've got two daughters, not only is your estate divided in half, but of course their husbands get to control it and get to add it to their own wealth. So all of a sudden, you 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 as a lord, you as a noble, you as a gentleman are trying to build up this great estate for your family and for your dynasty. The last thing you want it to do is to be divvied up and used to bolster the estates of other people on their way up who are also on, on, on the make. That's the last thing you want. So basically, in the 1300s, they start using a load of legal trickery to try and make it so that only men can inherit as tall and they completely wipe women out of inheritance. So they basically, it's all quite sneaky, they basically give their estate to someone else on the condition that they entailed it back to the person who'd originally given it to them on the proviso that it was male only. So you get these male only entails, uh, which some, which is the reason that Margaret wouldn't have come into all of the inheritance that her father had had, because some would have entailed down um, the male line. Um, and these entails, of course, uh, are at the heart of, of, of many dramas, aren't they? Years and years later, but Pride and Prejudice is an entail that causes Mrs. Bennet all of those problems because she's she's not, um, she's worried she's going to get booted out because none of her daughters are going to inherit the estate. It's going to go to a relative stranger. It's Downton Abbey as well, isn't it? Um, Lady Mary Crawley is not going to be the heir because there's an entail that keeps the property in the male line, male line, male line. She ain't going to get a look in. Margaret Beaufort's family, for whatever reason, hadn't done that. Either they couldn't, they didn't want to, or they just not go around to, we don't know. So Margaret does become a, a wealthy heiress. That causes her problems during her life. It means she ends up being uh, the, the pawn of politics in, in, in the way. It's the reason, probably, uh, that she's married so young, becomes pregnant so young. Edmund Tudor, desperate to father a child so that he can further his claim over over her estates and, and her money. So it causes her problems. But of course, she, she goes on to triumph over all of those. It's one of the reasons I find her such an inspiring figure. I know views on her are very mixed. Anyway, I hope that's been helpful. Um, I've written an article on this as well, which um, probably is worth looking at because I've been a bit rambling and the article sets out what I've, what I've discovered about her wealth. Like I say, I really I do do really want to stress you need to take what I've done in terms of comparing her wealth in 1450 to this survey of wealth in 4036 is scientifically not great but it's an eye-opener and hopefully it's a point of comparison and we can ground what we read um, in the light of it. Thank you very much for participating. Leave me some comments uh, in the comment section.